Those who don't know about bunting, I'll tell you a word or two about him. He too, he too, has a distinguished career. This is a man who wrote the first algorithms predicting the path of hurricanes from Africa to the Caribbean. We, his history is in organizations we know, like Noah and Nimbar. He's a professor. He's also a very dear friend. We have become very close friends. And he's involved with some others in a, an approach to say, stop blaming each other for climate change. Let's confront what we have and let's figure out what to do about it. So while it's forming with others, I was one of the ones who contributed to it and helped him, the Climate Adaptation Center. And it was easy to get him to agree to come and make a presentation <laughs> to us because he's only four miles away from <laughs> Thank you. Um, is there a way I can get back to the other screen? Because I actually want to show the other one first. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, my background is sort of eclectic. I'm a physicist, but um, when I received my degrees, nobody told me what I was supposed to do. So, uh, my interest is in physics, of course, but it's really wider than that. I've always been a person that really cared about the application of science and the service of society and so forth. So I enjoy discovering things, but what I really get my energy from is transferring that knowledge, and not just that I help to contribute to, but you know our our fields, our many fields, so that we can take advantage of the science in a way that solves real world problems. Um, I think we all have heard a lot about climate change. My career has been shaped by this climate change in 1982 or so, the first global climate forecasts were made on a computer that I helped to get working at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And I have to say uh, that that model, um, if anything, underestimated what was going to happen, but it was really prescient in forecasting the fact that uh, human-caused additions to our uh, biosphere, we're actually going to create a warming climate in the world. And so what I want to do is show uh, on this uh, slide first, is this chart, which goes back to 1,000, this is 1,000 years of climate. And um, if you, this is the northern hemisphere, and um, just like he showed the zero line, I'm showing one. Cross my breath. These all look like economic charts, don't they? Um, and, and, and they really are economic charts because they do affect the economy, and that's a, one of the themes that we're working toward. But um, if you look at the trend from the present uh, average trend over the last hundred years, you'll see that there was a, a long period of time where the temperatures in this black line were below the average trend over the last hundred years. And in about 1870, which is uh, right around here, you see a rather steep and incredible rise in the temperature uh, of the northern hemisphere. And that rise is uh, synonymous with the Industrial Revolution, which started about 1870. Uh, there's a, a lot of factors that go into this. Uh, you may realize, but I don't think that it sinks into us, that it took the Earth about three billion and a half years to produce the first billion people. Uh, and it took 150 years to add the next seven billion. So the industrialization of the world is part of it, but it's the number of people that are living better lives because 
of the technology boom. And I, going back to some of what Bill said, my theory about why we don't have inflation, even though we have a, this economy that's pumping out jobs like crazy, is because our uh, technology has advanced so fast, we've become so efficient in technology, and the price point of technology has gone so low, and that's part of our cost of living. And, you know, you can buy a TV set that, uh, you know, used to cost uh, 10 years ago $10,000 for 100 bucks now. And computers are like that, too. In fact, uh, today is the anniversary of Apollo 11 being launched. Uh, and four days will be the anniversary of landing on the moon. Uh, that flight had the first computer, handheld computer. <coughs> that handheld computer was the uh, predecessor of the iPhone and the laptop computers. So when you th and, and by the way, the power of this is more than the first great supercomputer. So I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, and of course, when you do things more efficiently, it drives the costs down. And while we have inflation in a lot of areas, uh, technology is not going. So, and that's a big part of the economy. But all of that industrialization and progress has um, come at a cost to the climate, which has warmed perceptibly. It's actually warmed now uh, about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit since 1870. Now you might not think that's a lot, but it is a lot. It's huge when you consider the global climate. And in fact, the northern parts of our northern hemisphere, and the southern part of the southern hemisphere, the Arctic regions, are warming at a rate of double what's warming in the in our zone. So unfortunately, we're getting um, double warming, and that's having an effect on sea ice and our ice cores, which are melting now. So people ask, well, how do you know the temperature was what it was, you know, 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago? And it's because we, we've gone into the sediments and drove down to the ice cores, and we've measured the amount of oxygen in the ice cores, and we can measure the amount of greenhouse gases in the oxygen bubbles that are in those ice cores. So that's how we, we compute the temperature. Uh, the other thing I want to show you here really quickly is this is the Mauna Loa Observatory in, uh, in Hawaii. And that um, graph there is the increase in CO2 since 1960. And you'll see every year there's this up and down. And that's when the trees in the northern hemisphere get leaves, and when it drops the leaves. Summer and winter. So there's always a diurnal uptake and uh, expansion of CO2 depending on what season it is. But it's unmistakably gone higher now. And in 2019, it's at 415 parts per million, which is the highest in any history that we've ever been able to study. And we know in past climates we've had warmer temperatures than we have now with less CO2 in the air. So that's a very big measurement right there. So if I go now to uh, past climates, uh, back to 1800, and look at sea level, um, sea level was much lower back in 1800 than it is now, and you can see as it got to the Industrial Revolution, and a little after that, it starts rising, and here's where we are right now, right in this green zone. Sea level's gone up since 1950, about nine inches around the world. That was the easy nine inches, okay? Uh, because we had sort of room to spare. But now it's going up about an inch every eight years, and that rate is expected to accelerate into this blue zone. And this is what the models are predicting now on sea level rise. Uh, 34 models that are in this um, with different assumptions. And the lower boundary here is predicting by 2100, we'll get about another two feet 
uh, of sea level rise. That's the lower bound. So the question is, what can we do about it? And the answer is, if we turned off all the greenhouse gas emissions today, it would take 50 years, because the half-life of CO2 is about 50 years, for it to come out of the atmosphere. That means for the next 50 years, no matter what we do, we're going to have a warming climate. And that leads to a very important, uh, I think, uh, sort of wake-up call that I have, is that we're thinking too much about who's to blame for climate change, and we're not thinking about enough what to do about it. And what to do about it isn't just turning the lights off and not refrigerating our food. No one is going to do that. <coughs> but we have to think of it, uh, what's in our best personal interest? Because people uh, only act out of their self-interest. And the answer is that we're having impacts today that we can measure that are really serious impacts and they're affecting our lives. And, but the impacts are really happening in different areas are having different impacts. <coughs> so in Florida, where David and I live oh, a good part of the year, we have sea level rise, and Florida is, this is really an amazing thing to think about. Florida, if it were a country, would have the 17th largest economy in the world, the state of Florida. It's a $1 trillion economy. It has seven trillion dollars of real estate on the shoreline. It has the second largest shoreline in the United States, only second to Alaska, 1,450 miles of shoreline. Um, it's pretty low. Mount Florida is 30 feet above sea level. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, if you start talking about uh, <coughs> nine more inches or 12 more inches or two feet or whatever you want to talk about. Um, you start to see, wow, uh, th there's risk. There's a lot of risk in Florida. Um, but that's not the only thing that we worry about in Florida. We worry about hurricanes, and that happens to be sort of the thing I really like. Um, there's nothing like a good hurricane to get me excited. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, the, the hurricanes are, are interesting because, of course, we've had hurricanes for a long time. We've had really bad hurricanes for a long time. But what we've noticed now in the last uh, decade or so is not so much that we're having more hurricanes, but that we're having that these hurricanes are, are, are developing different characteristics. For instance, uh, you all remember Irma. Uh, when I started in weather forecasting, there were no hurricane forecast models. But when Irma came off the African coast, seven days before it hit Florida, we knew within 200 miles of where it was going to hit Florida. That's really an amazing thing that's happened in the progress. Because of that, 6.2 million people were evacuated from Florida before it hit. And it was bedlam in Florida for a week. Every highway was jammed, every hotel. They were flying in and bringing in tankers of gas to make sure people didn't run out of gas. It was the largest human migration in a week's time in the history of the world that we know of. To get out of the way of a hurricane. If it went to Cuba, interacting with Burma right at the last minute, Florida would have had a Category 5 hurricane go right up the center of the state. And it would have been a catastrophe. It was bad as it was, but it would have been a catastrophe. Bruno had was the highest wind speed, sustained wind speed, of any Atlantic hurricane in history. And it lasted longer than any hurricane in history at a category five. And we thought, okay, that's going to be it for the year, right? And then we had Maria knock out Puerto Rico, also a category five. And that very year, we had Hurricane Harvey go into Texas with 60 inches of rain, which was double the record for rain. So 
What we notice is that the hurricanes have two new characteristics. They're spinning up really fast, and they're staying intense longer. They're also stalling off a lot of times when they get to coastlines and meandering for, for much longer than that moving away like they used to. And that is because, as I said earlier, the gradient between the temperature at the pole, which is warming faster than the temperature at the equator, is going down. And that means that the jet streams that used to be really intense are weaker, and they're further north now. So the hurricanes aren't getting pulled away by the jet stream like they used to. And so this is what's going on. The third thing we've noticed about hurricanes is that the eyes of hurricanes have become very small. We had Hurricane uh, Michael last year, Hurricane Irma the year before that, Hurricane Maria the year before that, that had eyes less than 20 miles wide. And when you think about an ice skater doing the spins, what you notice is that they always start with their hands like this, they start spinning and they bring their hands in like this. And when they do, they spin faster. And when the ice shrinks in a hurricane, because of the conservation of momentum, they spin quicker, and that's what spins them up to the super hurricane um, intensities. What is driving some of that is the fact that the sea surface temperatures, along with the land temperatures, are rising so that the hurricanes themselves are sucking that energy out of the sea, and that helps them get the energy to intensify. So these things, things like that are impacts of global climate warming that we have now. Can you imagine if a Category 1 hurricane was parked off, let's say, New York City, and it went from a Category 1 to a Category 5 that far north, and then hit New York City with no time to evacuate? What kind of a catastrophe would that be? So what we're talking about now is not if that's going to happen, but when it's going to happen. And we're not really prepared for those kinds of issues from on a lot of levels right now. So another issue we have is red tide. You probably have heard about the red tide in Florida. It's uh, called Corinna brevis. It's a algae that grows naturally in the Gulf of Mexico and in a lot of other places has red tide. But the kind we have, the Corinna brevis, happens to be toxic. It actually emits toxins into the atmosphere. And those toxins actually make people sick. And so when last year along the coast of Florida, we had the worst red tide uh, I can remember, probably one of the worst ever. And um, we have postulated a number of uh, uh, climate warming issues that have made red tide worse. One is uh, really interesting, there's a lake in Chad, called Lake Chad in Africa. And that lake used to be about 50 times bigger than it is now. It has dried up with the climate warming. And the bottom of that lake is iron. And when the uh, winds blow across the Sahara, it picks those iron filings up. And you can see it on the satellite picture, these big dust pods going over the Atlantic. And they eventually get into the Gulf of Mexico, and the iron comes down into the Gulf. And when iron interacts in the Gulf of Mexico with another uh, bacteria called trichodesium, the trichodesium releases nitrogen. And when it does, the Corinna brevis eats it and goes into a hyper explosion. And that happened last year. And that's because of climate change happening in Africa. So if you wanted to do a foreign aid program with the 17th largest economy in the world, I'd recommend that Florida work with Chad to fill that lake. <laughs> because it will help our economy in Florida not have uh, red tide at the, at the level that we had it last year. Okay. So 
we're all interconnected. The Interdependence Center, which I'm happy to be a member of, um, is about those kinds of connections. The things that we think are, are local are really global, and the things that we think that are global are affecting the local. And so that's the big, the big thing is how do we bring it down to a level where the understanding goes up uh, for, for the local population and what, what can they do about it? So the second thing I want to talk about is here in Colorado. So I want to go back to that um, other presentation. In Colorado, we have, um, what did you do there? Alt tab. Alt tab. Alt tab. 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 On your left. All the way. Yeah, no. Alt. Alt tab. Okay, great. Um, in Colorado, uh, I have a I have a Mac, so I don't know how to work these pieces. <laughs> My other, my other computer is a Cray. That's why I used to have a bumper sticker. <laughs> uh, so anyway, you, you all know, if you're from Colorado, that we had this huge pine, uh, uh, pine beetle kill. And uh, it killed millions of trees here. And it was enhanced by the fact that we had years and years of drought. Last year, um, this is a map of the United States as of a few days ago. Uh, where it's white, there's no drought. Last year, from uh, the Great Lakes all the way to the West Coast, about 90% of the entire, that part of the entire state was in uh, extreme or severe drought. What a difference a year makes. We just had the largest dump of rain in the United States in history in the last eight months. It wiped out the California drought, the Utah drought, the Nevada drought, the Colorado drought. And in fact, uh, it, we don't have any drought in Colorado for the first time in probably 50 years where there's no county that has drought conditions. And in fact, there's only a few counties in the whole United States that are, have severe drought now, and it just happens to be up in the Seattle area. So if you really want to go and have a nice summer, Go to Seattle, there's no clouds, there's no nothing. <laughs> um, but we've gone, and this is, a, this is another signature of climate warming. Climate warming is not just the world is getting warmer, it's that we're seeing big extremes. From one year we go from one event and to, to the next event. So you'll hear on the news, well, it just had all that snow in Colorado, how could we have global climate warming? Well, that's exactly what we should be seeing. That's what we predicted 35 years ago would be the signature response to a warming climate, that we would see more extreme events, and we're certainly getting that. Um, this is the um, snow pack right now in Colorado today. It's 761% of normal right now. Actually, normal right now is pretty much zero. But we still have a lot of snow here. Um, and it's, we have 50 times more moisture in the snow this year than we did last year. 50 times. So this is a mass ejection event for Lake Mead that's happening right now. For the first time in 30 years, Lake Mead will actually rise this year. <laughs> And that provides the water for the West. Mm -hmm. So this is a wonderful thing. And we're lucky that it did rain here in the last two weeks, because we would have had serious flooding. Because Lake Dillon Dam is not a flood control dam. It, they, they, they drained it way down. And boy, that thing filled up in a month. And everything that's going over now will go over. There's no way to stop. But we're through peak flow right now, so uh, it's, it's worked out really, re really great. The other, um, so I just wanted to, to show you that um, uh, places like Colorado 
We're not worried about hurricanes and we're not worried about red tide. But we're worried about water supply, we're worried about snow for our ski area, we're worried about forest fires. We had two forest fires in the last two years, right here in Summit County, that were scary. One was within walking distance of my house. Uh, in fact, th this is actually a funny story, because David and Christine were in Sarasota, I was in Calgary, and we're talking about what do you, they should do to evacuate for Irma. <laughs> All of a sudden, this news bulletin came on and it showed a tanker plane flying over, bombing the trees. And I looked at it and I said, oh my God, that looks like our house. <laughs> and it turned out there was a fire right behind our house and our neighborhood was evacuated. One year later, we had a fire on the other side of the lake that almost burnt down a huge subdivision up there and came very, very close. But this year we don't have forest fires. We almost had floods. So that's the, uh, that's the nature of climate warming. Now if I can remember it all from tab. There we go. Again. There you go. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, we just, uh, so we formed this, uh, uh, we have this idea that adaptation is a big part of the solution to climate warming. Because we're having the climate warming and we can't really stop it in our lifetime, what choice we have is to adapt to it for a while until a bigger solution evolves. And I want to say this, in all honesty, I believe we will solve this problem. I don't think we're in a situation where it's an extinction situation for the human race. Of course, it will require that we actually use the carbon computer up there <laughs> if we're going to survive, OK? Um, but the, the thing is that we have to recognize that from the beginning of humankind to 1990, we had this body of knowledge that we developed. And from 1990 to 2019, we doubled that knowledge. Think about that. 10,000 years of human history to get that first increment of knowledge, and 29 years to double. Between now and 2100, when the worst effects of the climate warming are supposed to hit, we'll either double or triple knowledge by then. By then, we'll be doing things that nobody thinks is possible today. And when we do those things, it will include a way to control the climate warming. And it won't be a way, it'll be a hundred ways that together will be the solution. So, but in the meantime, until that evolves on a global level, we have to adapt to what's going on, and that's what the Climate Adaptation Center is about. Um, the polar bears are, are trying to adapt right now, and this seems like a... My friend who is helping me with the center, he's Canadian, so he, he really wanted to put this into the, into the presentation. Uh, but our problem really is that climate science is extensive and it's pointing to a, a really big change in the future. And ad so adaptation now is no longer a choice, it's a necessity. If we want to maintain our lives similar to what it is now. Uh, but there's a, a, a big void between what we as scientists understand and actionable information that policymakers, people in industry, people in government, people in academia can deal with to actually mitigate and adapt to climate change. So I understand a lot about it, but if I can't communicate that to you in a way that makes you able to inform your own decisions, then I don't feel we're doing our job. And that's the, the goal of the CAC is science in the service of society. 
So what we're trying to do is be the broker of all of this wonderful science that's been done, where 97% of the scientists in the world agree with that uh, climate warming is being uh, accelerated by the activities of man. Um, and then how do we coordinate all that information into actionable things that we can do in order to make our situation better? What kinds of things would that be? Well, it's not turning the lights off, I'm telling you, because people aren't going to do that. But we can protect our shorelines. We, we have technology that's been around since the 1700s. There's a country called Denmark uh, that some of it's a thousand feet below sea level. And somehow they've held the sea out for 250 years. They know how to do that. That's what they do. It's part of their survival in what they do. And they spend a lot of money doing it. And we're going to have to spend a lot of money doing it too if we want to protect our way of life. Um, if we want to cure red tide, then what we have to do is make sure that Lake Chad gets full. It's a diversion problem. We, we built the Panama Canal and then widened it a couple of years ago so uh, commerce could go through there. It really wasn't necessary to do that, but it was economically viable to do that, so we did it. So the thing is, is that we're going to launch a whole new uh, economy in the, in the, around the world that's going to be the climate economy. And it's going to be based on innovation and products and services that help us to adapt to the climate warming, to give us time to get to a global solution. And in Florida, that's probably going to be the biggest new industry in the state in the next 50 <coughs> years. We have all the tools to do it. We have the knowledge to do it. But now we have to start working together, which is sort of a hard thing to do in this country right now, to actually create actions that are going to mitigate some of the worst consequences of the water we have. In Colorado, it's also going to be important. Uh, new watershed management, uh, water control in the cities. You know that Las Vegas, Nevada, when in 1972, reached its first one million people. There are three million people living there today. Today, it uses less water with three million people than it did with one million. That's possible in Denver, Colorado. But we don't do it yet. So these are things that happen that we can do if we want to. And our hope is that in the Climate Center, we'll be able to give you the information so that those kinds of decisions can be made on a large regional level and we can start solving some of these problems locally. From global to local, that's where it happens. We have a global problem, but without acting locally, we're not going to solve it. So that's the uh, goal of the CAC. I hope I gave you some uh, little snippets into what's going on, and uh, I think now we can take questions. We have time for a few questions. Either speaker, either subject. Sir. I have a question for the how do you quantify the totality of human knowledge as they doubled from 1990 to now? The second question is, there's been a lot of publicity lately about this theory, the most cost-effective way to deal with climate change is to plant some astronomical number of trees. And I was wondering what you thought about that theory. Okay, two, uh, repeat for the group. Yes, the first is how do I know, or how do we know, that climate, uh, that uh, information has doubled? And basically, if you look at, um, for instance, the advances in medicine, the number of patents, uh, the number of copywriters, uh, the number of, quote, books. Okay, well, books are different than they used to be, but you know what I mean. Uh, what's in the Library of Congress? What's all the data that we have, all the information that we have? It suggests that we have had a doubling of, of knowledge. The second question was um, related to 
this theory in which we can go on to the city that the most powerful oh, right. would be the climate change by planting. I forgot how many trees they said, you know, the trillion trees, and that would reduce the yeah, so uh, uh, Two thirds of the Earth's surface can actually uh, grow trees. And uh, at one time, about two thirds of the Earth, Earth's surface was uh, covered by trees, and we've cut them down to grow crops and all of those things. So the theory is, is if we went and planted trees all over the earth that we would solve the climate problem. The fact is, is that that's a huge undertaking that's not likely to happen. Um, first of all, what's happened to the ground is that um, the trees used to be on is that they've lost their uh, soil. And the ground itself now dries out much quicker than it used to because the temperature, say in California, the summer temperatures are 3.2 degrees warmer than they were 50 years ago. And California doesn't have a lot of trees now. And so that dries the, the Earth's surface out quicker. And that's why they're having massive fire, forest fires, for example. Last year, they had 1.7 million acres, which is eight times what it was 20 years ago, of forest fires. And that's because the land is, cha is changing desert vacation setting in. So um, planting trees is part of the solution. Also, farming is part of the solution. 13% of all the greenhouse gases released are in the farming industry. People don't realize it's equal to what cars do. And it's because we have 1.5 billion cows all producing methane. Methane is a greenhouse gas that's 50 times more powerful than CO2. So what are we supposed to do? Stop eating meat? No. If you look at it as a system, uh, if you look at the Great Plains, we had tens of millions of buffalo that used to roam the Great Plains. And that created the farm belt in the country. And what they did is they ate grass, and then they pooped all over the ground, and then they ran all over it, and they ground it into the ground, and that eventually built up the soil there. It was the micro, the microbial building of soil is really important. So if we went from deep till farming to low till farming, which is possible today with today's technology, we wouldn't put, be putting so much carbon into the atmosphere from agriculture. So if you take the trees, you take agriculture, you take solar, you take alternate energy, we burn natural gas instead of coal. We have so much natural gas in this country, we can't run out of it now for 500 years. And it's 50% more efficient than coal as a carbon uh, greenhouse gas. Just switching from coal to a natural gas will cut the U.S. emissions by 30%. And that's something we have. We have 10 minutes, one and two. Yes, please. Sure, I'd like to try to connect the two presentations. So it's a question for both of you, but um, how are financial markets considering climate change and how should they be? So it's a great question. In fact, Bob and I were talking uh, earlier about it where, you know, to some degree, Markets are not being allowed to function. You know, as an example, uh, you've got the flood insurance, which is actually run by the government. Uh, when Hurricane Harvey hit Cal uh, Texas, there was a story in the Wall Street Journal about a home that, you know, had been the last 30 years, 32 years, had put in claims with uh, the flood insurance program like 20 times, almost like every year or so. And you know, if, if it was, if this was a regular insurance company, and it was an eight hundred thousand dollar home, so it was a pretty good house, uh, but they had paid out two and a half million dollars on the claims over this period. If this was a private sector insurance company, they would have paid that first claim and told them, you know, that's it, we're not going to cover you, or they would say your insurance premium is now going to be far more market based and make it cost prohibitive kind of insurance that would actually reflect the risk of building in that area. So I think we, we do not have uh, insurance that is really reflecting the, the risk of, of living on some of these coastal areas, which 
would begin to impact decisions that are being made by individuals um, and, and certainly would help in terms of maybe looking at alternatives and supporting some of these mitigation, which I'm in full support. Probably the most effective way of dealing with any kind of climate change is to uh, look at ways of mitigating it and using models that have been around for centuries as examples for what we can do and, and, and pricing those out are far more, I think, uh, way to, far better way to approach it. So, yes, uh, another one for Bill. Um, you're showing that we're, we're creating more jobs, but the wage growth isn't there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for a long time. 30 years we've been talking about our economy shifting from production to service. Is that part of the rationale or part of the reason that we're not seeing it's, wage growth? It's complicated. I think that plays some role. The problem is oftentimes the perception of uh, the service economy is, is, a, is a waiter or a waitress. Um, in fact, uh, they, uh, so it's another story for, uh, for maybe uh, another day uh, about how the media is often not understand it. But the reality is that the service economy offers, yes, low paying jobs, but also very high paying jobs. Um, as probably most of you have worked in the service economy and probably have made some fairly good uh, income over your lifetimes. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that we are increasingly becoming a knowledge based economy, and that's kind of what I think about when I, when I move toward this, and that's why. You know, educating our, our, our people for the kind of jobs that need to get done uh, become very uh, important. And I get kind of nervous about this push of late uh, for minimum wage increases, which when you have a 3.7% unemployment rate, those kind of wages are already rising quite a bit, so the, the pain is not so, so great. But what I'm very nervous is when we do have the next recession, and I do believe the business cycle is still alive and well. It's just what is that negative shock that's going to tip us from growth to downturn that many of these people are all of a sudden going to find that businesses are not going to be willing to pay them $15 an hour or $12 an hour. They, you know, those people would say, I'm willing to work for you for 10, but legally they're not going to be able to offer them that job when you have these minimum wages. Uh, Milton Friedman famously said that the true minimum wage is zero that's the wage that you earn when you don't have a job. Um, and uh, so I get nervous about how some of these markets will interplay in particular for these least skilled workers that are out there. In addition to it, uh, we do have this transition of the baby boomers retiring. So you have this mix going on. So, you know, um, uh, when I retire, I'll be replaced by another economist who is probably getting paid less than I am, being that he's maybe 20, 30 years uh, behind where I was uh, with regard to the income. In the back, sir. So you didn't mention government debt. How, how hooked are we on that? Uh, does it ever have to be paid back? The short, answer, the short, the short, the short answer is no. So the question is about government debt. I mentioned about education. Education by far is my biggest concern uh, for the U.S. economy. In my, in my top three concerns, uh, government debt is absolutely up there. This is speaking from somebody from the state of Illinois who, when, when retiring, uh, I am going to be joining my very dear friends, Bob and David, uh, in the Sarasota area. Uh, because uh, uh, we're seeing this movement of people away from these basically uh, in fiscally challenged states. And Illinois is, is, is by far the worst. Um, but with regard to the federal debt, uh, no, the federal debt does not have to be paid back. It's one of the beauties of having a government that keeps going. It doesn't have to pay it back. It doesn't mean that there's no burden with regard to that. We have doubled the share of federal debt from what had been around 40% of GDP. It's now up to close to 80% of GDP on a publicly held basis. And, uh, you know, it represents when you, whenever you increase the debt, it means that you are spending more than you're taking in in terms of revenue. And whenever you do that for your household, to spend more than you're earning means that you'll be able to, you won't be able to, you'll have to consume less into the future. So this represents an obligation to the next generation, the younger generation, which is, uh, you know, going to be a real, a real challenge because as it is, their incomes, as we've talked about, 
have not been doing very well in this post uh, Great Recession period. Um, the good news is, is that, in, that interest rates are all in all still quite low, so it's being managed. And you know, the fiscal side, and Congress, they're not going to deal with it. They're all well aware of it. The Congressional Budget Office explains to them, and they, they know exactly what this burden is. But until, unfortunately, my personal view is until it becomes a crisis, this, the Congress doesn't attempt to react to these things. Uh, similar with regards to the climate right. change aspect. Same thing. Sir. Yes, um, one of the ways to boost productivity is to uh, utilize the capital that we have. But you said there's still slack in most industries. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on the capital utilization rate and whether it's closed up a lot? So uh, I, I put a put up there the capital uh, capacity utilization rate, and it's uh, it's still low relative to historical trends. The problem with that, and I talked to my colleagues at, at, uh, at the Federal Reserve who actually put together the industrial production series. Um, when you go to these shows, uh, you know, I grew up in manufacturing. My father worked at a machine shop, ran a machine shop in Brooklyn, New York, and my first job was working on a. On a Bridgeport milling machine. Uh, and that was a time period when you actually turned dials and people were craftsmen and so forth. Now everything is computer driven, CNC manufacturing, computer and market control. Um, and, and, you know, how many, well, this might be a bad audience, forgive me, but you're a little older than, than the typical audience. And I don't mean that I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. How many of you have a phone, though, that's older than? <laughs> Older than three years. Oh. Interesting. A lot, lot fewer than I would have thought. That's what's happening is with, with machinery. Is that within a short period of time, like that Bridgeport milling machine in that generation, the one I was working on was probably about 40 years old, 50 years old, and it was still perfectly fine doing its job. But like your phone. Your old phone would still work and still do the job it was designed to, but the new phone does so much more and so much faster and better. That's the same in manufacturing. So I'm actually the reason why I'm optimistic about productivity in the next few years is because during this post Great Recession, there was a lack of capital investment, and there was a, a hesitation. So they missed a generation of the quality improvements that's happening. So. I think that when they see the new machines, it's going to really blow things away. And that's why, if you looked at the second productivity chart, which is a year over year chart, it's already up over 2%. So I'm very optimistic that we'll see that continue over the next several years. And that's going to give the room for uh, wages to rise. And that could be the engine for further growth in the economy. Because keep in mind that 70% of our economy is consumer spending. No, I didn't. Last question. Mark. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to return to the insurance question for a minute. And this whole notion of what's happening with private insurance companies and their ability to actually forecast what's coming and raise premiums in a way that doesn't put them at grave risk for the insurance and reinsurance industries. I'm curious to hear comments from both of you. I'm going to give it to Bob because Bob is living in the two states that are experiencing these kinds of extreme situations. In terms of, I would just say, the number of insurance companies that have pulled out of Florida for the hurricane side, and then you've now got this new risk on the fire side here in, in the mountains. Yeah. So, um, and it's, it's tough because uh, the, the old concept of insurance, which I support, really, is that every homeowner everywhere insures everyone else everywhere from whatever happens, okay? So that's, that's the old model. But the government starts stepping in and regulating and it creates these unintended consequences sometimes. And in flood insurance, what happened is uh, they, they decided that that was something that the government should strip off and probably the insurance companies really wanted that because they saw that as a high level of risk. <clears throat> so they funded that for a certain amount of time, and then, of course, when that funding ended, there was a crisis in the insurance business. So flood ins national flood insurance ran out of money 
after there were some floods. And there was, the Congress didn't appropriate money. So then they tried to figure out, well, how can we, how can we you know, solve that hole? So that what they did is, instead of the national pool funding that hole, they went to the homeowners who were affected by floods the most and said, you have to do it. So for instance, in Florida, flood insurance now has gone up 300% in the last 10 years. Okay. The association I live in, uh, which is only nine uh, townhomes, very nice townhomes, uh, the, the flood insurance used to run about $10,000 a year, it's now $54,000. So if, if we don't keep, stay together and sort of say, okay, well, they live on the coast, they should pay more, which is, you know, I get it. But also then you have to say, well, people who live in fire areas have to pay more, and people who live along the Mississippi River have to pay more, and people, and then what you do is you start limiting where people can live and you're giving up productivity of, say, coastal ports that ship all the stuff into the United States and send it all over the world for our exports, our grain, and everything else. People have to live in these places to do those jobs, so they have to have some sense of safety to do it. So um, we, need a free, we need a free market, but we also need a market that's going to respond to where people want to live. That, should be a choice because we, the jobs aren't just in the interior of the country and where it rains, they're all over. But I'm asking a little different question, which is the insurance companies that really to predict what's going to happen, they rely heavily, you know, yeah. on... So that's big data now. Okay. And they're, they're starting to get smart. They all have data scientists. People like me are being asked all the time, kind of in brief, uh, on what's going to happen. And of course we have... You saw the, the two blue lines on sea level rise, right? There's a, a wide dispersion on what happens out 50 or 60 years, and that will come down, just like the hurricane forecasting has gotten so, well, 50 years from now, it'll be like that. But in the meantime, it, there's going to be a lot of ambiguity in the system, and that, that causes a lot of confusion. I just want to wrap up one by saying one thing, because I... Uh, we're raising $2 million to get this CAC started. It's all private funds because we don't want government money. We don't want them telling us what to do and what we can talk about and what we can't. And so um, there's, out on the counter, there's a, a description of what we're doing and we are looking for uh, donations at this point. So if you're so inclined, uh, to care about this as a, an economic and personal, in a personal way and in an economic way, which I think it's the biggest economic driver of the next hundred years is going to be fine for me, then this is a way to sort of get control over what we do and bring it down to the local level. So I hope you will please take that and read it and consider it. Last word to Yes, I'll just add it um, with regard to, because I disagree slightly with Bob where you know, I do believe, and I, I believe in pooling, but I believe that um, it should be within the risk zones that, that, we're, that we're talking about. I think people who live in, in forested areas should be a risk pool at pricing out the risk of having fires, and the same thing for the hurricane. And, and, and individuals with that information about insurance will be able to properly judge the risk of moving into these areas. Uh, if, if you had the same low uh, uh, parkage flood insurance that you had years ago, people would not recognize the real risk of damage that could happen to their property. We were originally thinking, when we were going to be leaving Illinois, of going down into the Cape Coral area, which is just tons of canals and so forth. But in that sense of looking, when Irma came about, and Cape Coral was right in the track of the original storm, I said to my wife, I said, you know, if this is going to be our forever home, do we want to be dealing with an evacuation <coughs> and a hurricane, you know, when we're eight years old? Got to and I, we said no. So then we decided to move up to Mount uh, Florida, and we moved inland a bit into Lake Branch area to get elevation, but still be very close to the, the beautiful parts of Sarasota, which God willing will still remain above the once, 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 <laughs> we, once we build these protections to keep it going. Thank you both. There were three.
There were three forecasts made tonight. One, hurricane, drought, snow, climate. <clears throat> One, economics, macroeconomics, the outlook for the United States. And one that said we would make a hard stop <laughs> at 6.45. <laughs> Two of the three were correct. <laughs> That's not bad. You said plus or minus. Plus or minus. All right, thank you for giving your permission. Thank you very much. Keystone, Parker, thank you.